All right. Uh, good morning. Welcome to the session on thinking functional style. My name is Venkat Subramanyam. We're going to talk about functional programming and various things related to it. I'm going to use examples from Java 8, Groovy, and Scala along the way. Best time to ask a question or make a comment is when you have it. So please don't wait till the end. Anytime is a great time for questions, comments. And if you do have a question or a comment, please do grab my attention. You know, start saying a few words. Uh, you know, wave at me if I can see you. Just draw my attention some way, and I'll yield to you, and I'll listen to your questions or comments. So uh, let's get started. Uh, this is a topic that I'm definitely very excited about. It is a great time to be in the programming world. If you caught me about maybe about three or four years ago and asked me, what do you think? I'll say, oh, life is boring in programming. All that is about to change, and it's already changing. It's pretty exciting times uh, to be programming with uh, certain very interesting constructs. So I'm going to share with you some of my thoughts and what we have seen along the way. So let's get started. So my first question I would start for myself is, why functional programming? What, what's the big deal about it? Why all of a sudden should we be interested in something like functional programming? And, and the answer is uh, several fold. One is, if you really look behind uh, in time and see where we came from and to what we are doing, uh, we are developing applications very rapidly. And, and the types of applications being developed are across a wide spectrum of domains. It's, it's, this, this field is one of those unique fields where we cut across every other aspect of human life. It's pretty amazing to see where applications are being developed. And given this, there are two kinds of complexities that we have to deal with. One is called the inherent complexity. Inherent complexity is the complexity that comes from the domain. And domain-based complexity is extremely hard to remove. That is the nature, the fundamental problem. We can try to cope with that complexity, but we cannot get rid of it. But I would argue most of the problem we fight every day is not as much as inherent complexity, but the other type of complexity, which is the accidental complexity. And accidental complexity comes from our own efforts, the methods we use to program, the types of things we program with, and a lot of these complexities that we tend to introduce, and accidental complexity is something we could definitely remove and, and manage applications a lot better. And one of the nice things about functional programming is, as we will see a little later on, it does help us a great deal to remove some of those accidental complexities. We'll look at quite a few examples along the way to see that. Well, I remember very clearly back in the 80s uh, when there used to be these constant fights on mailing list. One group of people saying, oh, oh, sucks, and the other group of people saying, oh, rocks. And it was kind of funny to watch this battle go on between these two groups. And then right about middle of 1990s, things quieted out. Nobody started arguing whether O oh, is the right thing to do or not, and people just started programming with object-oriented languages. And so by about late 90s, everybody has gotten onto that bandwagon. Now we are trying really hard to get them off that bandwagon because most people have gone overboard using OO. Oh, oh. and, and it's kind of a, a assumption that we have to use objects for whatever we do. I had the privilege of uh, pairing up with somebody a few months ago. We sat down to solve a problem. We looked at the problem and what we wanted to solve. And as soon as we sat down, the first thing this person said is, I guess we should start writing a class. And I said, wait, 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 why would we need to write a class? And the person kind of looked at me like I was a fool and said, how do you do anything without having a class first? And that's when I realized that we've gone all the way overboard. We assume that everything has to be classes and objects. Uh, in fact, I remember uh, one of the experiences I had a lot, long time ago. Uh, I was working for a company, and I had just worked for this company for only about three months. And my boss came to me and he said, well, we normally you know, have a meeting every uh, first Friday of every month, and somebody gives a talk and we use that as an excuse to buy food and eat. So we decide you're going to give a talk next month. So I was kind of wondering, what could I talk possibly working in this company for about three months? And so I decided 
thought about it and started writing a talk and I was putting this talk together. My wife came along, looked at the talk and she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm preparing for a new talk for this company that I've been working you know, recently. And she looked at my talk title and she said, you better have your resume ready, you're gonna get fired if you give this talk. My talk title was the name of the product, an object disoriented system. And, and the reason I gave the talk was because I see that they have gone overboard in applying the object to the paradigm, a lot of accidental complexity had crept into the application, very difficult to maintain. And, and that is something we face quite often. Now, one of the other things that's gone on is, this happened about 2003 timeframe, when an engineer walked up, uh, walked up to his boss and he said, it ran really fast before it melted. So they started having trouble putting a lot more into a processor, and they started going towards multiple cores. Now, you may say, what's the big deal? We've been doing multi-threaded programming for a very long time, so how does it really matter that now we have multiple cores? After all, Java has had multi-threading from day one, so why get excited about this all of a sudden? Well, the reason is, in a multi-threaded, multi-core system, things are quite different. An application that may be broken already may pretend to work correctly on a single core, but on a multi-core processor, it ends up being broken. One of the reasons for that is, on a single processor, multi-threading is more or so multitasking. On a multi-core processor, the threads are on steroids. They run continuously, and so they can access more of the data much more rapidly, and this leads to quite a number of issues. One of the main problems with this is, in a multi-core processor, not only do we have multiple uh, caches, we may also have multiple levels of caches as well, and as a result, it becomes really problematic to write programs correctly and make it run concurrently. So all of these really become huge problems for us to deal with as we develop applications. Now, one of the problems also arises from having mutable state. Now, you may say, well, in Java, we have been doing mutable state for a very long time, so why is it anything to be worried about right now? Well, it turns out, mutability in itself is not a terrible thing to do. We have done this for a while, as long as the mutability is constrained to a small level. And what about sharing? Well, remember what mom told us, right? Sharing is a good thing. We should share all the time. So mutability is not too bad. Sharing is great, but shared mutability is devil's work. And the minute we bring in shared mutability, we have all kinds of problems we have to continuously deal with. And it's extremely difficult to work with mutability, especially when multiple threads start sharing it. So given this, we could, we could say the first thing is that more mutability we have in code, the more error prone the code really becomes. Now, I remember one day, a programmer walks up to me and he says, this is a piece of code he had written, and for whatever reason, this code doesn't seem to produce the right result. And I looked at the function, and I have to say, it was not a very long function, about 20, 25 lines of code, so nothing really large and messed up. And I look at the code quickly and I said, well, given this input, that's the output you should be getting. And he said, yeah, I know, right? But that's not the output I'm getting, I'm getting some other output. And, and so we both were kind of puzzled. We started staring at it like we were two fools sitting and trying to find the problem. And we go over this several times and eventually we are stepping through the debugger. Right about line number seven, I noticed he is picking up the input parameter, and on line number seven, he modifies the input parameter to another value. As soon as we found that out, I said, wait a minute, darn it, are you actually modifying the input parameter here? And as soon as I pointed it out, he's like, yeah, I know, that's a problem, sorry, wasted your time, and he walks away. Well, our brain is wired in a way, we're in denial that we would be doing something like that, and yet we write code like this all the time, where we modify a state, and as smart as we are as human beings, we really are not capable of maintaining various different state changes in our mind. And, and because of that problem, a lot of errors creep in, and, and generally speaking, the more mutability we have in code, the more bugs we have, more errors we have in code as well. It is very difficult to reason a piece of code which is dealing with mutable state. 
On the other hand, if a code doesn't have mutability, it is much more easier to reason that code. It is also easier to make a code more easily concurrent when we don't deal with mutable state because there's no shared mutability involved. It becomes a lot more easier to work with the code and distribute it across multiple threads and multiple cores as well. Well, that's, that's enough talking. Let's get to a little bit more concrete things. So what is really functional programming? Well, what's old again is new once again. This was created a very long time ago. It's been around for a good 40, 50 years. You know, it's really funny though. I would talk to somebody who's a programmer and they would tell me things change extremely fast in our field. And I would look at them and say, yeah, things change extremely fast in your field, you think, what are you smoking? And it doesn't really change fast at all, in fact. Think about this for a second. How long, when did object-oriented programming become really prominent? I would say, well, it kind of became prominent in the early 90s, give or take a few years. Well, object-oriented programming was actually introduced in 1967. So if object-oriented programming was a, as a, was a human, it had a very terrible neglected childhood. Nobody wanted to deal with this for about good 23 years, and then we all of a sudden got excited about it. Well. After all the time, uh oh, programming became mainstream, and now, just now, we are getting excited about functional programming, which has been around for a good 40 to 50 years at, at large. So you can see how very slow changes in our field in a certain area. But this is something that good news is, at the same time, we're not jumping on something newfangled. This has been around for a very long time, and so it's very mature in the way that it's been for so long. Well, one of the very first thing in functional programming is we do assignment-less programming. Now, you may think about this and say, how in the world could you program without assignments? Let's draw a similarity with something else that we have seen before. When you program in procedural languages, we end up writing spaghetti code. And, 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 and almost everybody here, I'm sure, has read uh, uh, Dijkstra's work and where he talked about go-tos are evil. In fact, it is so much so that programming language like Java, in fact, has the word go to as a forbidden keyword. We can't even use go to's in the code. Now, anytime somebody even thinks about using a go to, Dijkstra turns in his grave, right? So we don't want to really use go to's in programming, but because we're not using go to, does it mean there are no branches in the code? No, absolutely not. Branches and jumps happen all the time, except in a structured programming that's done in a very controlled manner. In a very similar way, when we talk about assignmentless programming, it doesn't mean assignments don't happen. It means that we don't perform assignments in the code, and that happens in a very controlled manner under the, under the covers, under the hood itself, and that is one of the nice things about assignmentless programming. Now, what is the real benefit of doing this, though? Well, because we're not mutating variables, we are eliminating a lot of moving parts. Now, I, I saw this tweet by Michael Feathers quite a while ago, and I thought this was a, really a brilliant tweet. He said, in object-oriented programming, we try to encapsulate the moving parts. In functional programming, we try to eliminate the moving parts. That's a great way to think about. Rather than encapsulating moving parts, what if we eliminate the moving parts? It becomes a lot more easier to work with it, and, and it becomes easy to remove that accidental complexity complexity that we normally introduce in programs. So we deal with immutable state more often than not, and as a result, it becomes easier for us to program. Now, functional programming has a first-class citizens as functions, and this leads to what are called higher-order functions. So what does that really mean? Well, in object-oriented programming, we are used to pass objects to functions. We are used to return objects from functions, and we are also used to creating objects within functions as well. Well, we can do to functions now what we are used to doing to objects in OOP. We can pass functions to functions, we can create functions within functions, and then we can return functions from functions as well. So we can not only do object composition, but we can build applications with function composition as well. And so this gives us uh, more tools on our hand to put together 
with the application itself. So this gives quite a number of benefits that we can make use of. So given all of this, one of the biggest benefits of functional programming is that we actually are able to program in functions with no side effects. Now what does it really mean, functions with no side effect? What, what does that really buy us? Well, what it means by a function with no side effect is, I, I remember one experience quite a long time ago, this was kind of uh, funny in retrospect, but we, we were developing an application, a fairly large engineering application, and we were porting over this application from one version of operating system to another, and when we ran the application and a lot of tests along with it, we noticed that there was a difference in the output at about the seventh decimal place. Now, we were kind of puzzled. Why would it be different in the seventh decimal place? Accuracy was very important in this application. And one of the engineers started digging through it, and he spent really several days trying to figure this problem. And when we got it done, he found out that there was some piece of code, something along these lines, and it had a you know, fairly big expression. And in this expression, it had a variable being incremented more than once. And, and it took him quite a while to figure this out. Once he did, and he started, started breaking it down and, and dividing it into multiple lines of code, and then he found that the result on the platforms were exactly the same when he did this, but when this expression was executed, it was not. And eventually he pulls up Bjorn Stoostrup's book, this was a C++ application, and clearly in the book, Bjorn Stoostrup says, don't do this. So he called the team and said, I want to know which moron did this, I want to kill him, because he was very angry because a lot of time has been wasted doing it. But why is this such a bad idea? Well, the reason is if you notice in this particular uh, example, there is not only a mutation going on, the variable is being mutated multiple times. And compilers don't consistently decide how to evaluate this mutation when an uh, expression is about mutating a variable more than once. And, and because of this uh, you know, ambiguity, different compilers, even the same language compiler on different platforms may end up dealing with this very differently. And as a result, bugs creep in very quickly in applications. Now, on the other hand, if we remove this kind of mutability in code, what does it really bias? Well, the benefit is when a function has no side effects, it becomes extremely easy to resend the application. So imagine that this is a function we are dealing with, and when a function has no side effect, we got one significant benefit. As long as you keep sending in the same exact input, you get exactly the same output, no matter how many times you possibly call this function. Because this function has no side effect. So what does it mean it has no side effect? When a function doesn't have side effect, it is not affected by anything outside, and it doesn't sneak around and start mutating something outside. So in other words, it takes a set of input, doesn't modify anything outside, doesn't modify the input, performs this logic, and then it provides an output output. So as a result, unit testing this piece of code is much more simpler than unit testing an impure function. Because a pure function will consistently give exactly the same output no matter how many times we pass exactly the same input. So that's one big benefit of a function with no side effect. But this also leads to something else. Because this function produces exactly the same output every time you call with the same input, the benefit is it is very easy to read send it, but this leads to referential transparency. So what is referential transparency? Referential transparency is where a function would produce the same result and you can refactor it to another version of it as long as it continues to produce the same result. And, and this gives enormous power for compilers to perform optimization. Let's think about this for a minute. Imagine for a minute that we have two functions with us and both of these functions are very pure. They don't mess with data outside, they don't sneak around and modify data anywhere, so they really are, both of them are very pure. And none of them depend on each other. Well, as a compiler, I could decide that I want to run the function one first, and then once function one is complete, I want to run the function two after this. So I could run them in this order, and the net result I get out of these executions is going to be some value, but I executed function one and then executed function two. But as a compiler, I could definitely decide, because these two are pure functions, for some whatever reason, 
reason, maybe memory allocation and where the data is on registers, maybe I can optimize this even more. So I decide to run function two first, and then I'm going to run function one after this. Now, the result of both of these computations are going to be exactly the same because these two functions are pure. If these functions were not pure, I'll be scared like hell to make this change optimization from a compiler, but as a compiler, this gives me the freedom to run these in this sequence, or if it's more efficient, to run them in this order. Or even better, as a compiler, as a JIT compiler, I can look at my hardware and say, hey, look, I got multiple cores on my hand, so there's absolutely no reason to do that, and I could actually run them concurrently at the same time, and I can distribute these two on two different cores to run concurrently and get the result and process it. So this gives enormous capability for the compilers to optimize code when a function is pure. So that is one of the biggest benefits of having functions with no side effect. And all of these are first class capabilities are very inherent in functional style of programming. And so the benefit is we can really make use of the hardware much more effectively, better optimization, easier to reason, easier to program, fewer bugs in code, and we remove the accidental complexity. So we talked about quite a number of uh, you know, purposes and benefits here. Let's continue a little further and talk about two different types of languages. This is where things get a little bit complicated. I can say that today, and when I say the word today, I'm including Java 8 into it, there is absolutely no language worth the salt that doesn't provide a functional style of programming today. In fact, for crying out loud, even C++ is on board with it. So almost every language can do functional style of programming. But it's important for us to draw the distinction between a functional style of programming and a purely functional languages. So in other words, let's think about this with a little uh, example of some languages to consider. So we can think about uh, this purely one aspect, which is a higher order function. And what this means is you got lambda expressions. You can create cla uh, functions, and then you can pass functions to functions. And I can say that there, there's almost no language worth its salt that doesn't provide this feature right now. But that's not not enough, though, a lot of times. We want to go a step further from here, and then we could consider a function with no side effect, or does the language actually enforce creation of functions with no side effect? If you want to think about it this way, you, nobody can stop you from writing object-oriented programs in, let's say, C language. But why would you? It becomes really hard to write object-oriented code in C. Instead, you would rather use a language which really promotes, supports, and even enforces the object-oriented style more so than a structural language like C would. In the same way you can think about, you can use functional programming in a language that doesn't support functional programming but it's much easier to program in a language that enforces it. I was teaching a course at the, at the university on programming languages, and this was a, a very short course over the summer, and I decided to teach about eight different languages in about six different weeks. Only about five students survived the course, but that's a different story. Uh, but one of the students came to me and he said, he has been programming in some different languages, and I exposed them to program in Scala, Clojure, Erlang, and, and various other languages, and I was just asking them what they thought about these languages, and and a student I respect a lot, I've known for several years through other courses, uh, said that he was a little bit more comfortable programming in Erlang than programming in Scala. And I was kind of a little surprised. And I said, why would you say that? And he said, when he was programming in Scala, he would get stuck with something and say, I quite don't know how to program in a functional style. And then quietly he would start modifying the code, and the program would work all of a sudden. And he got his work done, but then he would look at the code and realize he has fallen back on his old practices. On the other hand, when he was programming in Erlang, Erlang would tell him it's, it's, it's way or the highway, and he would have to constantly fight with it. About three or four hours later, he would have, have a piece of code working, and it was functional style, but it took a lot of effort. And, and his point was, if I really wanted to change my paradigm of programming, I would rather use a language that strictly enforces it and beats me down 
around and says, do it this way. And I told him, you're absolutely right, but there's another aspect to life is actually getting the work done. And when you have the pressure on your hand, I also like languages that are very pragmatic in that, make it work and make it better. So there's a balance to really strike for in this case. So I, that's where the hybrid languages come in, into in the picture. So if you want to think about it this way, I would say languages like Java, C Sharp, C++, Python, JavaScript, Ruby, Groovy, all of these fit into this outer circle. They only provide for us this, this uh, particular feature of having higher order functions. And I call this the functional style of programming, but not functional programming. Uh, in fact, you could argue some languages listed here, like JavaScript, people actually argue is it really functional or is it more dysfunctional, actually? So it's kind of questionable, definitely, right? But, but these definitely are not functional languages. These are more of languages that provide functional style of programming. And there are almost, I would say, almost every language that we use in the mainstream now falls in the, into this category. But, but a more stricter way of looking at it is, in addition to providing higher order, we also want functions with no side effect and enforcement of it. And to various degree, uh, definitely arguable though, our language like Haskell and languages like Erlang may fit in. And, and then comes along certain set of languages that kind of have a one foot on the, uh, the high, higher order functions and another foot on the pure functionality, meaning they give you uh, ability to enforce it, but they also fall back quite a bit, if you will. For example, the languages I would put into this category are things like Scala and Clojure. And Scala and Clojure are languages that are hybrid languages. Clojure may be a little bit more towards functional than Scala itself, but clearly some of these are hybrid languages. You can do full functional programming in them, but the language is not going to stop you if you fall back on imperative style of programming, much like how you could write object oriented programming in C++, but you could write structural programs in C++ as well. Those are hybrid languages in the structural to OO area. These, I would argue, are languages hybrid in the OO to imperative to functional area itself. So as we program in these languages, we have to ask ourselves, what are we programming in? And based on that, we may have to vary our uh, you know, uh, uh, discipline, if you will, on making use of these different languages. So, so that's where I'm going to start uh, looking at some code examples and see how these things are going to work together and, and what these uh, features provide for us. So we just took a look at some of the languages out there and, and what that really fits into. So how does it really feel to program in some of these languages? The very first distinction I want to draw is we apply what is called state transformation rather than state mutation. So the idea really is, rather than taking an object and mutating its state over and over and over, we instead take an object and transform its state. So think about it for a minute. If I give you a dollar and say I want to change, and I want you to break the dollar, I'll be really upset if you tear up the dollar and give it back to me. That's not the mutation we are interested in. What I would like to know is that I send you a dollar, and that disappears in your pocket and emerges out some changes for the dollar. So in other words, we want transformation of state rather than mutation of state. That is one of the essence behind functional uh, style of programming. So let's take a look at uh, several examples here along the way and see how these things are going to work. And I'm going to draw the distinction between imperative style and functional style. Uh, before I get into the code itself, uh, you can download the code examples anytime, not just now, but anytime later from this URL. But don't be in a rush to write this down. I will listed again towards the end as well in the bottom, so you can take a look at it later on. But if you're anxious to get to the code examples, I, I promise they're available on my website. You can definitely get them. So what is the difference between imperative style of programming and functional style of programming? To understand this, let's start with a little example. Let's say for a minute, minute I have a list of integer values that I'm going to start with. So let's call these values, for lack of better words, and let's say arrays dot 
as list, and there are a few of these values that I have to start with. What I would like to do is I want to double the values in this collection. So how would I go about doubling these values? Well, first of all, let's go ahead and print these values to begin with to make sure that everything is set up properly here. So right there is the values given to us. But I want to double these values and print them out. So how am I going to do it? Well, let's go ahead and start. List of integer doubled equals new array list of integer values. And then I would say for over here, int i equal to 0. And then i less than, let's say, double dot size over here. And then I will go ahead and say the value doubled dot add is going to be the value of the values dot get at location i, and then times 2. And then when we are done with this whole thing, we could output the doubled value as a result. So in this case, all that I'm doing is I'm taking the doubled value. Let's make sure I did add this properly here. So I have the doubled value on my hand, which is an array list. And this is going to be, of course, this is going to be the numbers, isn't it? There you go. Make sure that I'm iterating on the right collection, first of all. So that is the result we saw of this code. Well, this is an imperative style of programming. Anybody who has written code like this before? Everybody, right? Everybody in the room, some, some of you raising the hand very reluctantly because you never want to admit this in public, right? Absolutely. So everybody has written the code like this. How do you feel? Dirty, isn't it? <laughs> really dirty. You write this highlighted code, and when you go home, do you feel excited? You go tired, right? And the children come running, you say, don't touch me. I got to go shower, right? Because that's how dirty you feel writing this code. There's a name for this. It's called primitive obsession. And primitive obsession because we are programming at a very low level. And we have written code like this over and over and over. Now, you probably come across people who say, this is simple. Well, they're using a very wrong word for this purpose. The word they are talking about is not the word simple. The word they are talking about is called familiar. This is very familiar. Why? Because we've seen it so many times. And in fact, this is painful code. I would argue this, is code, this code is very complex. Now, wait, wait, wait. How could this code be complex when it's simple? No, it is not simple. It's familiar and complex. Now, why is it complex? Look at line number eight for a minute. What are we doing on line number eight? Look at the number of moving parts we have in this code. We had to go and set up the value of i properly first, then make sure it incremented properly, then set the boundary conditions. And after finishing all of that, four weeks from now, somebody comes and tells us there's a bug. And we say, oh, darn it, those off by one errors. Right? How do we feel about off by one errors when that happens? Right? So this is a very complex code, a lot of moving parts in it. Well, fortunately, in Java, we can do a lot better than this already. Well, rather than using this for loop, we can trade this quickly by simply saying, for example, right here, we could say, int and maybe an element in values. And clearly, we could say here, element times 2 to get the same result. A notch better, certainly, than what was before. And we traded this really gross for loop to something a little bit more elegant already. But we can do a lot better than this. If you look at this code, this is an example of an imperative style of programming. There are two smells when it comes to imperative style of programming. The very first smell of imperative programming is we have have to tell not just what, but how to do it also. So there are two things we have to say right here. Not only we told him what to do, but he also told it how to do it as well. We said, I want to loop through and get the total of this double of these collection, but here's how we do it. We first start with an empty collection. Then we loop through the old collection, pick one element at a time, multiply it with a two, then go ahead and add it to this empty collection we created. And then when we are done with it, go ahead and print the uh, resulting collection. Notice the level of detail, the primitive, primitive obsession 
pain that we had to go through to create this over and then and specify it, that's a lot of effort, a lot of energy being spent on doing this. That's one problem. The second smell of imperative style of programming is mutation, right? We continuously muta mutate variables. We say mutable is, is very big smell. Notice what we just did here. We created an empty collection to begin with, and then we continuously added the value to this collection over and over and over. If you turn up the volume of the computer now while the program is running, on line number 11, the doubled array is going to say, ouch, 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 several times, because you keep injecting values into it repeatedly. That's a sign of mutability that we have to do as well. So we can see those two signs of imperative style of programming here in this code. Well, we could do better than this already. Rather than going through the imperative style, we could program in a declarative style. So what is a declarative style of programming? In declarative style of programming, there are two traits to it. The first trait is we do not mutate variables like this. And the second thing is, rather than telling how to do things, we simply indicate what we want, and we let the underlying libraries decide how to really provide it. So we would use a combination of different functions to achieve our results, but we declare and say, go get this tiger, do this for me, but I'm not going to sit there and tell you every step of the way how to really do this. So in a way, think about this as how you would talk to a two-year-old child versus an uh, adult. Well, to a two-year-old, you would say, sit down, honey, hold this one here, now get up slowly. You got to repeat every single step, and we've been programming in Java like we talk to a two-year-old all the time. In a declarative style of programming, you simply say, that's what I want to get, and you expect this responsible adult to go get the things done. Of course, it depends on who the adult is that you're talking to, but I would assume that we can rely upon this good person to do the things fairly well for us. So that is an example of how we can do in a declarative style. Let's go ahead and see how this is going to look like in a declarative style of programming. Let's go ahead and leave that code up there so we can actually see it if you are interested in later on, but let's go back and see how we're going to implement this same operation here. I want to get a double of the collection uh, of the elements in this case. So I'm going to simply output the collection itself. Notice that I'm not going to even store it into a variable. Sure, I can store it if I wanted to. Nothing stops me from storing it. But I'm going to just print it in this case. And I'm going to start with values. And I'm going to call upon something called a stream. Now, what is a stream? Well, in Java 8, a stream is a, a, a fancy iterator on steroids. So this is actually going to give us a very nice set of features for nicely iterating through a collection. The old iterator gave us only two things. It gave us the next element and told us if there's more elements in the collection. This gives us a, some really nice fancy set of methods. And what am I going to do here? I'm going to do a map operation on this. And what is the mapping I do? Given a value give me a value times two. That's what we are saying. And, and now we are doubled each of the values. Then what do we do? We collect the result. Where, where do I put the result into a list again? And we are telling him that we want to collect the results back into a list. And, and that's what we did. Now, for this to work, I need to bring in a few things. So I'm going to bring in over here java.util.stream.collectors, which is a utility convenience set of functions. And now that I brought in the collectors, I'm going to simply say, collect this back into a list for me. That is all we did. Now, in this particular case, when I run the code, you can see it produced the same result as above. But look at the top code versus the bottom code in terms of what we achieved in this case. Well, in the bottom code, we were declarative in our style. We said, given these streams of values, perform a mapping operation. Let's think about what mapping really means. Mapping simply means that given a collection of input, I want to map over or transform the values from this input collection to this 
output collection. That is all we are saying. And rather than sitting there and looping through the value over and over and over, we are not looping. We put the looping on autopilot. And we said, go, you figure out how to loop. I'm not going to waste my time telling you how to do that. But instead, for every element in the collection as you loop through, I want you to take each of these elements and apply this transformation. There is no mutation involved in this code at our level. We simply say, given this input, don't modify the input, instead produce this other output. Now, if I go back and print the original collection over here, you would notice that the original collection is still what it was before. No, nothing has been modified on it, as you can see. So we only modified, uh, we, we didn't modify anything, we only produced the output collection. The input collection is still intact, but it was highly expressive. There is another added benefit to this example you can see here. One of the biggest benefits we see with this code is that notice in this particular case, we are mapping these collection of values, but the map operation itself could very well be done concurrently instead of being done sequentially. Now, if you go to the code in the top and you say, I want to go ahead and take the first collection, and because it's a large collection, I want to make this concurrent. How do you make that code concurrent? Well, good luck with that. Well, the bottom one is trivial to make concurrent, as we will see later on in another example. Towards the end of this presentation, we'll look at how it's easy it is to parallelize some of these as well. So we looked at a map operation, but let's look back at one more thing we just did here. Notice that unlike other functions we are used to in Java, this map function is a bit special now. This map function is a higher order function because to the map function, we have not passed an object per se, we have passed a function in this case. Now, the highlighted code here is an anonymous function, a lambda expression. Now, what is a function? Well, most of us would argue a function has four things in it. A function has a name, a function has a parameter list, a function has a return type, and a function has a body, right? So a name, a parameter list, a return type, and a body. Well, of these four things, I would argue, the body is the most important thing for a function. If you don't have a body, why bother having a function in the first place? So what about the body of this function? Well, the body of this function is to the right of the arrow. So the arrow separates the parameter list of this function from the body of this function itself. So we have the body of the function to the right of the arrow. Now that takes kind of one thing, three more to go. What about the parameter list? Well, the parameter list is to the left of the arrow. And in this case, Java uses, the health, uses a healthy dose of type inference to figure out what the type is. But nothing stops you if you really, really want to specify the type over here. You could have specified integer over here and said that this is a value. And Java is still OK with it, except that we redundantly specified what's very obvious in this case. So you don't have to really do that unless you work for the Department of Redundancy. Don't write that code, right? So we don't have to write that at all. So the type inference took effect right here. So we had the parameter list to the left, and we had the body of the function to the right of the arrow. Hey, what about the return type? Well, the return type is inferred as well in this context based on the signature of what map is expecting as its parameter. And finally, what's the name of this function? Who cares when everything else is done? It is an anonymous function function, we don't really need a name for it. But the beauty is we could reuse this also. We could assign to a variable and then use that variable here in the code as well if we really wanted to. So we saw an example of a map function that applies this transformation to each and every element in the collection. What we don't know is whether that application or transformation is done sequentially for each element, or it could potentially be done concurrently, that's orthogonal to this code. And as, as I said, we will, as I promise, we'll take a look at parallelization of this towards the end of this presentation, but keep the thought aside, we'll come back to it. So we wrote this in a declarative style. What are some of the benefits already? The first benefit is that the problem begins to read, the code begins to read more like the problem statement. 
Now, if I give you this code up here and ask you, what does the code do? You have to go through the loop over and over and over and also fear the fact that you may break out of the loop some other time. And that is complex. It takes a, quite an amount of time and effort even for simple code to understand. Whereas the code in the bottom begins to read more like the problem statement. Given a collection of values, double each of the values in the collection and convert to another list. So as the problem statement begins to read more like the code and the code begins to read more like the problem statement, then the domain experts can sit with us and say what they want and we can now start reasoning whether the code actually is doing something similar to what they expect. There is a huge amount of merit to that because it reduces the errors in the code, makes it easier to understand the code as well. The other benefit I mentioned here is that it's easier to make this code concurrent because there's no mutable parts in this code, fewer moving parts in this code as well. So these are the declarative style of programming we saw. Now, what we are seeing here is a code in Java. Let's quickly take a look at how this is gonna look like, let's say in Scala for a minute. So let's say we have the same set of collection of values. Well, as a little added bonus, if you will, in Scala, you can say, first of all, oh, let's start with that for a minute. Let's think about a few things that you have in Scala to begin with. Now, remember, we read a functional, uh, uh, we read uh, books like um, effective Java, right? I mean, would you, would you consider hiring somebody who has never glanced at at least effective Java book, right? Effective Java book is an absolute Bible. We have to read it, absolutely. Now, what does effective Java say? Effective Java says that everywhere possible use immutable variables and everywhere possible make things final. What a great advice. And then you look at Java and say, why is Java not effective? Right? If the effective Java says that's the way to write Java code, why is not Java not effective? Well, actually, I have a little news for you. They did take Java and they fixed every one of those problems in Java. When they finished it, they called it Scala, right? So Scala is, in fact, the effective Java in a lot of ways. Now, for example, when you create a variable in Scala, what happens? In Java, what happens? You gotta declare the type of the variable, but you also remember to mark that variable as final if you don't want it to change it. What if you don't mark it final? Well, eventually you probably hunt it down and make it final. Uh, when I was writing the uh, 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 book on uh, programming concurrency on the JVM, uh, one of the advices I gave in the book was, as much as possible, mark all your variables final. Well, it was easy advice to give. And before the book went to print, I told the publisher, give me half a day, I gotta make sure that I did put final everywhere in the code where I have to put it. I remember that afternoon where all I did was go through every line of code and make sure I put final. That was the lowest point of writing that book. And once I finished it, when it came out, somebody tweeted saying, oh my gosh, I look, I'm looking at Venkat's book, he's got 350 users of final in the book. And I replied saying, aha, but you still don't know where I forgot to put it still. So here is the problem. It is very easy to know where final is, but how do you know where you forgot to put final? That is one heck of a regular expression you have to write, isn't it? Well, in the case of Scala, it is a lot easier to find this. For example, if I want to declare a variable, let's say, I could say val over here, and I could say, for example, stir equals, let's say, hello. So now I can print the variable stir. Well, you could even say, for example, string and hello and print it. Now, notice in this case, the variable name is stir and the value is a string, uh, type is a string and the value is hello. Now, the question is, do I really need to place the string? Well, not really. Scala says it'll do a healthy dose of type inference so we don't have to specify it. But on the other hand, if I said stir equals, let's say, you know, howdy over here, Notice I get a very clear error at compile time. It says, how dare you try to set a value of howdy to stir? It is a val. You cannot mutate it. So when you declare variables in Scala, you got to make a very clear decision whether you want mutability or you want immutability. Remember I mentioned earlier, Scala has its foot on both sides. In a language like Java, it's easy to falter. In a purely functional language, you 
don't have mutable variables at all. You can only create values and you can never change them once you create it. Scala gives you a balance between the two. You can create a val and so quickly you can look in the code and say, of course it's a val, we are pretty safe. But if you want to make it a variable, you could declare VAR. Oh, by the way, VAR is called the keyword of shame in Scala, right? So every time you use the var, you gotta put your head down for a second before you go any further, right? So that's a keyword of shame. And now notice, I was able to modify the variable's value given this because we marked it as a var. Well, the beauty is you can very easily run a grep command and find out where you're using a var in the code and scrutinize it very quickly and say, is this a case where it is okay to make it mutable or is it a case where it should really be immutable and we can modify it to immutable variable very quickly? So it gives you that kind of benefit. In fact, uh, going a little further with this, if you consider a function, for example, let's say define foo for a minute, and then I say input is an integer, and then within this function, let's say I want to simply return input times two, and I'm just going to call this function foo with, let's say, the value two to get a value of four, well, that's great, but what if in this code, I got several lines of code, and suddenly I say input equals four for whatever reason? Well, notice I'm modifying an input parameter. Well, what does Java tell us? Java says it is much better not to mutate input parameters. And in fact, Java says mark your input variables fi uh, parameters final. That's what Java tells us, right? Well, what about in Scala? Well, notice I didn't put anything at all, but it gives me an error on line number three. And it tells me that I cannot modify the variable input because it is an input parameter, and I have no business modifying an input parameter. In fact, modifying an input parameter should be crime punishable under law, right? So it says, no, you cannot do this. Now, you may look at this and say, hey, that's nice, I like it, but is it possible to really make that variable mutable after all? Well, the answer is yes, go back and program in Java for that, right? So the point is, no, we don't want to encourage that practice, and that is how rigorous the language is in enforcing some of these rules. Anyway, let's get back to what we were talking about, which is doubling the values that we talked about. So let's take these values for a second, and what am I going to do here? I'm going to say val, values equals list, and I'm going to create this list. Well, off the bat, a list is an immutable collection in Scala. You cannot modify the list once once you create it. You cannot insert elements into it, you cannot remove elements from it, it is totally immutable. Well, but given this, I can simply say values.map, and remember the map function we used on the Java side, very similar here, and then I can say given a value, I can then transform this to value times two, and we can ask it to be transformed right here into a object, uh, uh, another object, and give us the result. So you can see in this case, given the input list, we got an output list which contains these values doubled. Now, of course, in, in Scala, we normally don't write code which is as readable as this, and real cool uh, you know, people in, in Scala would make it a little bit more uh, cryptic, if you will. So you could say an underscore in this case to solve the same purpose, and you can see in this particular case, you could simply put an underscore to say whatever the input value that I'm receiving, I simply want to double that value and return it, and that code becomes a little bit more uh, terse or concise, depending on how you want to see it. So that is an example of a code in Scala to perform this operation we just saw. Now, there are a couple of interesting things we could do. If you had a function that will do double, you could use the double function here instead of doubling itself, so there are some benefits you get out of it. On the same token, let's see how this is going to look like in Groovy. I could simply say, for example, here, define values equals, and I'm going to create a list of values, and one more time here, I'll call a collect method, and then I say value, value times two to double the value and print it, or much like what we saw in Scala, we could also say it over here, which is a special name for the parameter being received if it's a single parameter, and then we can double the value like that in the case of uh, uh, managing with the collection as well in, in Groovy itself. So we can see an example of how we could perform this operation 
So we went from what is this cluttered up, very high ceremonious, ugly code to something a lot more expressive, avoiding mutability and more declarative style. But you can also see the dial of how some languages are more concise than other languages. That distinction is going to be there, even though all the languages are converging together. There are certain languages that are a little bit more concise and expressive than others themselves. And you got to kind of pick and choose what may make sense. So that is an example of how you could go from more of an imperative style to a, a, a functional style or a declarative style. Well, that example was a bit easy. All that we had to do was simply transform the given number of input into a given number of output. That was pretty easy to do. However, what if, on the other hand, we are interested in doing a little bit more operation with this particular uh, uh, you know, uh, values? Let's say I want to total the values given in this collection. So how would I go about uh, totaling the values right here? Well, let's think about this. That's very easy for us to do. We could say total equal to zero, and then I, I, I want to output the total value. Right now it's a value of zero. But we could say for int element in values, and then we could simply say over here, total plus equals to the element. Now, again, you would argue that's a simple code, but really it's familiar code, not necessarily simple as you can see here, because in this code, we still are doing primitive obsession. We still are imperative. We still are mutating the variables. We are doing all of that. But you look at this and say, all right, this is good, but how in the world possibly could I implement this in a way that I do not perform mutation. That kind of is a little puzzling to our minds because totaling is by nature bringing things together and modifying how could we possibly deal with immutable way of doing it. Well, let's take a thought experiment for a minute and see how potentially we could implement this. Let's say for a minute I am interested in totaling the age of everybody in this room. And to total the age of everybody in this room, I've got a little uh, rules to follow. I have a little post-it note with me here, but this post-it note is, is special. It's a right once post-it notes. You cannot change it, you cannot erase it, you cannot rewrite on it. It is blank and you can write on it once and that's it. Now, I've got a bunch of post-it notes here, but I'm gonna start totaling everybody's age in this room, uh, starting with him. Oh, he's not smiling anymore. No, I'm not going to ask for your real age. So what am I going to do? I'm going to give him a post-it note and say, get started. What is he going to do? He sees this post-it note I gave to him has a zero on it because that's the age of everybody to his left right now uh, with, with age. He totals his own age to this value zero, but he cannot write on this post-it note. What are his options? Well, create another post-it note, isn't it? So he can tear off another post-it note, put his age on it, and what does he do? He then passes it to the gentleman next to him. He takes his own age, adds to the post-it note, and then creates another post-it note, and then passes it down. So as this post-it note travels through the room, everybody receives a post-it note, creates another one, and finally the post-it note I'm going to have from somebody up there is going to be the age of everybody in this room. So notice how we never mutated a single post-it note, but we ended up creating new ones. We could apply something very similar along those lines, and there are functions available almost in every language to do this. These often are called either a fold method, either a fold left or a fold right method, but they are also often called as reduce methods. Let's take a look at an example of doing this in Scala first, then we'll come back and look at it in Groovy, and then in, in Java after that. So let's go back to Scala for a second. We got these numbers on our hand, and I want to total these values. Well, the imperative style, we could do this in Scala, but we wouldn't, so don't try this at home, right? And, and that don't try this at home approach is, I want to print the total value, but how do I do this? I'm going to say for a value element in values, and then I could say total plus equals to the element. Well, this is not an idiomatic way to do in Scala, but it works, as you can see, because Scala gives you the freedom to write imperative style and hopes you have the wisdom not to do that, right? So that is an example of how, you know, I like this concept of freedom and wisdom at the same time, right? But, but discipline is still important. Well, rather than doing it this way, we could simply say print line over here, and what am I going to print out? Values.fold left. 
And the fold left method starts with a zero. Hey, what in the world is zero? Well, ask him, that's what I gave him as a post-it note. That's the initial value we gave to him. Well, fold left takes two functions. I'm sorry, two parameters. The first parameter is the object, and the second parameter is going to be a function itself. This function is a carryover and an element, and it returns a carryover plus the element as a result in this case. So notice in this case, we used a fold left method and all that we did in the fold left method is we said, given the initial value of zero and this anonymous function, lambda expression given to you, or in Scala we call it function values, then you take this particular value, C is the carryover, and E is the element. Now there's a very uh, subtle but important distinction here. The variable C and E are really not variables, but they are values. Every time you call this, a new variable is bounded to a new value, a pre-existing variable is not being new. So in this case, the C value to begin with is the value zero, and the E value is the first element one. So the result of this is the zero plus one, and whatever you return as a result, four left receives that result, turns around and calls the function one more time, but this time C is the previous result of the call and E is the second element. So it returns a one plus two, which is three, and then it takes the result three, calls this back again with C being bounded to the latest result and E being the third value, and then it just ripples through in this case. Now, in this case, we used a four left method here in Scala, but we can also reduce this further by using what is called a reduce method. Now, what does a reduce method do? Reduce is a special case of four left in this case. Rather than saying the first value is a zero, it simply uses the first element itself as the the first value. So in this case, we could say the first two elements A and B are being totaled into A and B, and then we can simply return the result of it, or you can go wild with it and simply say, given these values, I want to simply total those two values over here, and you can apply the reduce even further and reduce it uh, to that extent as well. So you can write the code in some of the different refactored manners, as you can see right here. Similar to this, let's go to Groovy for a second and we could say print line values dot inject over here, and it looks very similar to what we saw over there. Carry over an element, and C plus E is the result you want to return back from this call, and that is an example of doing the operation here in, in Groovy. Likewise, in Java, we could say, uh, rather than going through this imperative style to total the values, let's give this a try. I want to output the total of the values, but how would I start doing this? I'm going to say start with values.stream, and what am I interested in doing? Well, I'm interested in summing the values together, but sum, unfortunately, is only available on some specialized primitive types of streams, so I'm going to say math to int, given a value, return it to a value itself and perform the sum operation for me, and then you can perform the total operation on it. You can explore other functions that are declarative in nature for this as well, and you can pick and choose what may make sense. So that is an example of using more of a declarative style of programming in some of these languages as well. So to summarize what you've talked about so far, declarative is very expressive, and imperative bogs us down with details. So in a declarative style, you tell me what to do, not tell me how to do it. The underlying libraries take care of doing it. You, uh, let's understand this with one more example to nail these details about imperative versus uh, 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 more of a declarative style. For this, I'll start with Groovy for a minute, and then I will show you in other languages. Let's say for a minute we have some names of friends on our hand. So the names of the friends I have on hand are, let's say I have Bruce over here, I've got Brian, I've got, let's say, uh, Joe over here, and maybe I'll put Jane and Jill as well. So I've got a bunch of friends on my hand. My job given to me was to go ahead and print out the names of these friends all in uppercase on a single line. Well, let's see how we can do this. So I'm going to say, given all these names, for int i equal to zero, 
i less than names dot size i plus plus no nobody in 2013 should be doing that right that is insane so we will not do that instead we're going to say define names in uppercase and then we can simply say how about names dot collect and then we could specify what are we collecting given a name you want to turn it to uppercase right uppercase so that is all we are doing we got the names all in uppercase let's go ahead and print that and see what it prints out yeah that's great so far isn't it wait a minute but there's a bracket at the very end we, that's not what we wanted okay we could fix that so names dot uh, names in uppercase dot well we could do a for loop well not the other for loop so we could say name in uh, we could say names in uppercase great and then we could simply say print line name that was easy wasn't it well yeah but I don't want this in separate lines I want them on single line okay that's not a problem we can do that too right so we can quickly put a little uh, you know uh, expression over there and then we'll put a comma that was very easy wasn't it well okay not a print line just a print that can be fixed very quickly there we go you say well wait 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 but look at that stupid comma in the very end how do you get rid of that stupid comma in the very end hmm doesn't seem to be an easy way to do it oh I know a way to do it right you feel the pain don't you now you say names dot uppercase dot size and then what do you do after this and then I plus plus and then within this you're gonna start printing the stuff so you'd say print line names in uppercase dot get of I well that's going to be a print value right here that's great and then what do you do if I is not equal to names in uppercase dot size then go ahead and print the comma value with the space and then finally you can print to end the line right oh still there's a comma in the very end so it should be minus one isn't it always the off by one error how do you feel anybody who has done this yeah and remember the morning after <laughs> how you felt really terrible isn't it and you said to yourselves gosh this cannot be this bad so there's something really wrong in this field isn't it well fortunately we don't have to do all of that let's go back to this code and we will simply say print line names dot collect dot join and then a comma how about just doing just a very simple operation of just a little comma separated values isn't that easy right isn't the way programming should be though right so the join function said I'll just take these values and I will join them comma separated in fact we can go a step further with this notice how we apply the two uppercase on every element here so in groovy we can say names star dot two uppercase dot join and we could just do it this way all in one shot right here without going through any more ceremony in the code and it's quite happy with that as well so we could write code in a very highly expressive concise manner sure we got to get familiarized with some of the syntax and the functions available but you can see how it takes away so much of effort from our shoulders so that is an example of how we could use a very declarative style of programming in here and ask it to join on the same note we could take these friends names over here let's go to Scala for a second and I say names equals list of these names and now I'm going to say print line names dot map and what am I mapping given a name to uppercase is what I want to call on it and then I want to call a, a, a make string on it and then the make string is going to use a comma separation for these elements and here is a make string being used to perform the same operation here in in Scala as you can see in this case well what about Java well Java doesn't want to be left behind either so we could do this in Java as well so we could go back to Java and say well given a list of names over here so let's go ahead and say this is going to be a list of string let's say names equals arrays dot as list and then in this case we can specify that rather than going through all the trouble we uh, would otherwise we could simply say right here 
uh, what am I going to put on in this case? Simply output in this case the names dot. Uh, go back to the stream one more time. Well, given the stream of names, uh, what's the operation I want to perform? Well, it's a mapping operation I want to perform. Given a name, give me uh, uh, two a name dot two uppercase. So two uppercase. And then once we convert it to an uppercase, I'll collect the result back. And where do I collect it? By joining them using a comma. That is what I want to join with. And, and that is an example of how we could perform the operation right here in Java. We could apply a little bit of more improvement on this further, remove a little bit more ceremony. So rather than doing this, we could use a method reference and say, given a string, just apply the two, string, uh, two uppercase method on the string, and we can reduce a little bit of code further and simply apply the method reference here rather than using Lambda expressions. So we can see how we can again write code in a very declarative manner to perform this operation where we want to print the elements in, in a comma separated manner without the ceremony and the trouble of going through the iterative cycles and then we can make it very highly expressive. So we looked at the declarative style in Java, declarative style in Groovy and then also in Java and we saw, so let's summarize the difference between imperative and, and declarative style. In an imperative style of programming we convey how to do things. In declarative, we focus on what to do and let the underlying library take care of how to do things. And in an imperative style of programming, we use enormous amount of mutation. That makes it really hard to reason the code, makes it hard to understand the code, errors creep in, bugs are prevalent in the code, and it's very hard to make it concurrent. On the other hand, in a declarative style of programming, we transform code rather than mutating code, and that becomes a lot more easier to work with. In the case of imperative style of programming, we have a lot of side effects in code. Whereas in the case of declarative style of programming, we lean more towards a purity. Again, in a language that doesn't enforce this, the responsibility is on us to make sure our functions are pure. But the beauty is we can enforce pu purity, then we get the benefit of purity in the code very easily, as you can see here. We can pass objects to functions in imperative style of programming, here we can also pass functions to functions as well. We can return functions from functions, we can create functions in functions. Uh, later on in the session today, we'll take a look at how we can do some of those things with other functions we're gonna create as we look at more examples. It is very hard to compose uh, functions in an imperative style of programming, in fact, uh, this is something I did not realize for a while, but once I realized it, it was like getting a new pair of glasses seeing things. Uh, think about this for a second. If you look at Java or C Sharp or C++ or a lot of these languages, there are clearly two distinctive things we program with. There are statements and there are expressions. Just say the word statement for a minute. How do you feel? It takes the energy out of you, isn't it? a statement, right? And what does a statement do? The statement says, I have done something. And you tell the statement, can you do this? Yes. What was the result? And the statement says, I won't tell you, right? Well, but how do I know what you did? I put it there, go get it if you want to. So in other words, by default, statements force mutability. How evil they are once you realize that, right? On the other hand, Notice the word expression. Do you, you breathe lightly when you say that? You, I can see smiles on some people's face already, right? That's how expressions feel. And what does an expression do? An expression does the work and returns a result to you and says, here you go, that's what I got. So expressions don't force mutation. You could mutate, but that's your choice. But expressions don't force that on you. Expressions can do some work and give you back a result. So when you have a statement, you cannot compose using a statement. You call a statement, and then you build a block of statement, and you have to keep stacking statement after statement. In the case of expressions, you can flow through, and you can transform a data through an ex expression, and pass it to another expression, and then pass it down, and you can nicely compose functions to using ex ex expressions. In fact, I would argue uh, more a functional uh, language is more it is made of expressions 
and very few statements. In fact, there are some languages which don't have statements at all. They only have expressions, and they are a lot of fun to program with once we get a hang of it. So that's a very nice way to work with expressions rather than statements, and that's what you're seeing in this case is simply, uh, you know, so it's hard to compose applications when you have these uh, imperative style of programming. With a functional style of programming, we can use nice functional scoping, and we can work with it very nicely. So, so we're going to continue further and talk about working with higher order functions. I want to talk about higher order functions. I want to talk a few uh, things about how to compose functions within com functions and put things together. And then I'm also going to talk about uh, some of the examples of function composition itself further down, and then go into how to parallelize some of this code and look at some examples. Uh, so a question for you. Uh, I'm perfectly fine to go through further or would you rather have a break? It's your call. A timeout, I hear. So how about a 30 minutes timeout? And then we resume.